finally. The kids are all gone. Movie Booyah! night! I'm excited. What, what do you want to watch? Ah, <laughs> uh, action. Comedy. Okay. Dave Chappelle. Yes, that's my favorite. Yes. Okay. Drama. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Oh, for Pete's sake, can you make a decision already? Drama. Drama. You got it. No, 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 comedy, comedy, I need that, woo, I need that comedy. <laughs> need that comedy, let's go. How you doing out there, AC? Let me hear you make some noise, everybody. Make some noise, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm glad that you're here, you're joining us. In the conclusion of our teaching series called For Pete's Sake, we've been going through the New Testament books written by Peter to some Christians that were scattered around what is now modern-day Turkey. And over the last seven weeks, we've been doing a deep dive, helping people learn about God's grace and how to stand firm in it. So regardless of where you land spiritually today, however you identify, I believe that the last couple of weeks has great content for you to grow spiritually. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to download our app and Keep up with our teaching series there or go to AuthenticChurch.com where you can listen to all of our messages. They're stored there on the message page. A lot of us, I just want to let you know your prayer has been answered. We've been coming through a long winter and you've been praying for heat. And you came to Authentic Church today and, <laughs> and God's like, here you go. <laughs> so thank you for tolerating the heat for a little while. Uh, we are going to be okay. It's better than other places, if you know what I mean. That's why we're at church today. Hello, everybody. Uh, some of us are late to catch that one. So, so in our culture right now, we usually have to find ourselves in like two categories. We're either pro fill in the blank or we are anti fill in the blank. It just seems like categorically we have to find ourselves in one of those two columns and right now we're in a season where everybody is anti just into the anti category and I think some of you are going to give me a good amen on this part because most of us during this time are into antihistamines right like <laughs> we're all falling into that category man some of us are getting ready for that itchy eye nasal congestion and runny nose season for some of us our eyes are about to look like this people at our jobs won't know if we need claritin or if we just came off some stuff you know what i'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying. it's that season it's that season and for me pollen kills me i hate pollen man it really gets me agitated and of all the things that I'm allergic to I wish I wasn't allergic to pollen I wish I was allergic more to stupidity is there anybody else that could concur that you just wish that you were allergic I have a couple of people that are saying I am allergic to stupidity I mean imagine some of these epic fails recently you know that you've got a stupid person in your house when they do this this is definitely somebody in your house It's clearly stupid. <laughs> if you go to your local supermarket and you see one of these, you know that you need to bail. Somebody is a minimum wage worker that just does not care about anything there, right? Or if you go to the tattoo shop and you're thinking about getting a tat and you want to get this Pegasus and somebody's tatting Shrek on your back, you know, it, it's an epic fail. And so while we fall into categories of pro or anti, we often fall into two categories as well. We're either doing epic failures or we're allergic to something. We, we, we have epic failures and we're often allergic to things. Some of those fails were quite trivial and easy to get over, but some are hard to get over. And if you look into your life, and for those joining us online, if you look into your own life, Sometimes there are those breaches of character, those lapses of judgment, that thing where you just submit to temptation that allows you or robs you of the potential that God had placed in your life. For some of us, we've watched our marriages implode 
because of a bad choice. For some of us, we've lost jobs because of poor integrity in a particular area in our lives. And some of us, we've lost friendships because we weren't honest people. And the list could go on and on and on. And for those of us that have made Jesus leader and Lord in our lives, we declare that he is our Savior. It's a lot more difficult for us because we feel a little bit more significant pain when we make poor choices. Why? Because our conscience is alive and we have a morality that is not just logical, it's driven by the power of the Holy Spirit. But regardless of where we land spiritually today, regardless of how we identify, I want to let us know something. In case you don't know, none of us in this room or those joining us online are immune to failure. None of us are immune to failure. And when it seems like we fail, we also become allergic to other things. If we're really honest, when we fail, we become allergic to things like love. We, we can't receive love from people the right way. Some of us, we become allergic to peace. We, we, we can't allow our lives to just be settled. For some of us, it's to wholeness. But many of us in this room, the thing that we become the most allergic to is forgiveness. We struggle with forgiving others. And for so many of us in this room, you are struggling for you to receive God's forgiveness for a failure at some point in your life. I want to tell you today that we're not immune to failure. So that means we can't be allergic to forgiveness either. We're not immune to failure, so we can't be allergic to forgiveness. Now today is Palm Sunday, a day in which the Jewish people thousands of years ago were anticipating the coming of their Messiah. They were so excited and in Jerusalem during this time they were filled with hope that their Messiah would make his debut and would somehow up caused an upheaval to the government, the Roman oppression that the Jewish people were experiencing. The Roman people were hard on the Jews at that time, and they were looking to find freedom and hope and national identity and national security. And so their Messiah, they thought, would come and usher in this kingdom of peace. But really what they were thinking was that this Messiah was going to turn everything upside down, that he was going to come stick it to the man, and that they would actually have rule over the people that were oppressing them. Nothing could have been further from the truth. And so they had this practice during that time where they would lay down branches that they would rip off of trees on the pathway of a king to come in. It symbolized that this was their victorious king. It was a form of worship. And that day, there was so much noise in Jerusalem as this rabbi, Jesus, with his radical teaching, was making his way into Jerusalem. And they thought, this is finally our time. And so they laid out a path of palm branches to symbolize this is our victorious king. But interestingly enough, in that day, the king would kind of come in on a large horse. Jesus is instead riding a donkey, symbolizing that he's not coming in to bring a system of politics. He's coming in with a system of peace. And they totally miss it, just like we still miss it. Sometimes we're worshiping God, expecting him to do something for us, and we have the wrong expectancy around his arrival. For many of us in this room, the reason why we don't experience Christ more fully is because we have the wrong motive for his arrival. Too many of us think that Jesus is supposed to come all into our lives to remove away our suffering, and Jesus says, I'm coming into your life to remove away your sin. Here it is. <laughs> He's not trying to get us to escape from what we're in. He's trying to bring a little bit of heaven into what we are currently experiencing. And what they couldn't ex understand was that Jesus was coming with a totally different angle. And one of the people who missed it was his close friend, a follower of Jesus who had been studying under his ministry for years. This guy, Peter, who we've been looking at over the last seven weeks. Peter was a bold and a brash follower of Jesus. But Peter, though, like the others that gathered that day in Jerusalem, thinking that their Messiah was going to come and cause this upheaval, they didn't know that Jesus wasn't coming to turn over their political government. Jesus was coming to turn over their self-government. Just like Jesus is trying to get our self-government upside down so that he actually is the leader and the Lord and the Savior of our lives and not just a convenient cosmic vending machine. 
that's supposed to distribute blessings into our lives just because we sang four songs or because we prayed or because we gave a certain amount. We either look at God as a cosmic vending machine or God is some sort of cosmic cop that's supposed to give you a ticket because you did something when you were nine years old and he's just getting you back now. <laughs> All right, all right, so, so, so li li listen to this. All four Gospels record one of the biggest failures in all history, an epic failure. And I'm sure that the Bible doesn't record any other failure with such dramatic and precise detail. Have you ever noticed that Peter was the person that was closest to Jesus, and yet his failure was so dramatic and we identify it with it because all of us, at some point in our lives, particularly after we put our faith or trust in Jesus, we've denied Christ. We've denied the Lord. We're not immune to any of that. And Jesus spoke to Peter's failure before it happened. And so Luke, who was a follower of Jesus, he was a doctor. He was a ministry companion. He wrote two books in the Bible's New Testament. He wrote a book called Luke, a gospel of Luke, which tells of the ministry, the teachings, and the life. I ain't done yet, okay? I, 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 I don't want no alarms. I'm not finished. I got about a half an hour left. <laughs> oh, I'm just messing. So Luke, who is a follower of Jesus, writes down the words. And he says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned again, he's giving him vision and mission. Strengthen your brothers. Why is Jesus telling him this? It's because we're not immune to failure. And that's why we need faith. Because we'll all fail. Faith is like Claritin. <laughs> it kind of helps you get over whatever is ailing you. And Peter says, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. You know, he's this brash, impulsive guy. He's committed. He's way in. You ever have one of those best friends, one of those homies, one of those girlfriends that are like, girl, I'm with you all the way. Or they're like, dude, I got your back. But it's like way, way back. They don't really have your back when stuff goes down. <laughs> I was a bad little kid for a little while. And um, I, I had a best friend back in the days, and we used to run around White Plains Road in the Bronx and around Co-op City, and we just used to think of dumb, bad things to do, but we were committed to each other, like, yo, bro, if you get caught, I got you. I got you, bro. It's going down, man. We're, we're, we're together. And one day, we just decided to do something really stupid and delinquent. We were just throwing rocks at cars and stuff, right? Like, not a pastime that any of you should ever do, but for some reason, Back in the 80s, we were throwing rocks, and I hit this one car, and the car screeched to a halt. And the guy started reversing. So I said, dude, run. So me and him started taking off through our neighborhood, running, and I could hear the car peeling around to try to come find us. And so I slid underneath a car, because I'm the ninja like that. You don't, you're not catching me. So I went under this car, and I'm like kind of hiding, and my friend, I could see down the block as I'm looking out over through the tire, the guy catches him, and the dude just starts snitching on me, bro. He's like, no, his name is Wayne Francis. <laughs> Wayne Newton Francis. He lives at Hammersley Avenue and all this stuff. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, this dude just told me that we're down together. And then I watched him get in the car of this guy, and ladies and gentlemen, true story, he put on his seatbelt. <laughs> Como se dice, if you're getting abducted, you don't put on your seatbelt, man. Yeah, you scream, you run, you hide, but you don't try to go for safety then. He squealed me out, but thank God we didn't get into a lot of trouble, and here I am, I'm alive today. Well, he bailed when I needed him the most, and Peter bailed. When Jesus needed him the most. Jesus said, hey, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny three times that you know me. And then, here it is. This is a powerful verse here. Then they seized him. They seized Jesus and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. Every word in scripture is given to us for a purpose. I know that the times where I failed Jesus the most was the time when he and I were most distant. 
when I was following him and the proximity got a little bit further, where my prayer life got a little bit off, where I couldn't forgive people quickly enough. Whenever I was at a distance with Jesus, let me hear you here. Listen, distance makes denial easier. And for some of us in this room, you're following Jesus. You'd say, yeah, I'm a follower of Jesus. But the question is, how closely are you following him? Because if you're far, it's going to be easy for you to deny Jesus. And just as he is about to go into his hardest period of time, his best friend leaves him out to dry. And so we learn more about the story. When they had kindled a fire, he is now Peter in the courtyard where Jesus is now moving toward where his scourgers are going to really get into his passion and his suffering. But he's at this courtyard, and Peter sat down among a group of people. And then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light, looked closely at him and said, hey, this was the man that was also with him. But he denied it, and Jesus, Jesus knew that this was going to happen. But he denied it, and he said, woman, I do not know him. First time that he has done that. Now, it's just a slave girl, right? In his mind, maybe he's rationalizing. She's just a slave girl, just like you and I rationalize. He's just my coworker. I don't have to tell him that I'm a Christian. He's just another student. He just, he's just another person that goes to my gym. Why do I have to express my faith? Well, I'll tell you why. A denial can make all the difference in the world. It's a big deal. Here in the text, the word denial actually means to refuse or to disdain or to deny something. To listen, here's this, repudiate or disown or even disclaim association with someone or something. That's big. And it just gets more progressive because a little later, someone else saw him and said, you are also one of them. And he said, man, I am not. And then after that, the interval of about an hour, someone else insisted and said, certainly this is one of the guys that has been with him, for he too is a Galilean. And I can tell you that the bystanders understood that he had been with Jesus. Now, what I want you to know is that Peter still does not come to his senses. We learn that he says, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. This is a very powerful verse here because in one other version of this story, like when you're reading the New Testament, there's four Gospels. It's like reading uh, the same story on different channels. <laughs> Think of it that way. They, they, they tell us that he even started to cuss. He started to swear to make sure that everybody knew that he wasn't with Jesus. And right at that time, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. He turned around and suddenly all those words started to come back in his head. Before the rooster crows today, you're going to deny me. Jesus noticed his failure when it happened. Imagine that. Peter was literally Jesus' best friend, and he denies him. He spent three years almost constantly in the presence of Jesus. He was at the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus. He saw Jesus do miracles and heal people. He was the inner circle of 12. In fact, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. That was a miracle. A miracle that most husbands would never pray for, actually. So, <laughs> he saw people get raised from the dead, and yet he denied Jesus. Why? Because of the fear of man. He had the fear of people. And many of us in this room know what it feels like to fail God and then weep bitterly. That's what he did. He wept bitterly because if we're not careful in an unguarded moment, it's easy for all of us to deny the Savior. So let me make this message practical for you so that this afternoon and Monday you have a useful way of taking this message into your day-to-day -day spiritual life. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to fear God and not people. You, you got to fear God and not people. We live in a culture that doesn't have a real good concept of God. I see people with tattoos like, only God can judge me. Like, dude, that's the last person I want judging me, right? Like, <laughs> he's holy. Like, I'd rather you judge me. Yeah, you criticize me. You judge me. God's judgment is perfect. You know, like, here's the other thing. Fear God and not people. 
Sometimes we become so intimidated by people. Now think about this. Jesus is suffering. He's getting beaten. And there's so many people that are asking questions. Are you the son of man? Are you really the son of God? All of these different questions. And Jesus stands up to his questioners and he denies nothing. But Peter, with three questions, denies everything. Big contrast. Let me give you some wisdom from an Old Testament book written by this guy, mostly Solomon, who was a wise king in ancient Israel. He says, fearing people is a dangerous trap, but trusting the Lord means safety. The reason why some of us are trapped right now in your spiritual growth is because you fear people and you don't fear or revere God enough. The reason why you're stuck right now is because you make choices that are more driven by people than it is driven by your purpose. You, you're trapped. You're trapped not because you're stuck through some weird circumstances, probably because fearing people is a dangerous trap. But trusting the Lord, it gives you, it gives you safety. And the reason why this is included in the Bible is because all of us fail. We are not immune to failure. So don't be allergic to forgiveness. For some of us right now, you'd grow spiritually today if you just allowed yourself to accept God's forgiveness of you. That you can move into that grace. Listen to me, somebody. If you're not immune to falling, please do not be allergic to rising again. Because that's what the gospel is all about. That if Christ is in you, what can hold you down? If death couldn't hold him down, what's going to hold you and I down? We're, we're not immune to failure, so don't be allergic to forgiveness. Now, most of us, when we fail, we don't want to go back to the place where we messed up all over again, do we? It's like going back to special crime unit SU, SVU, right? Like, you know, some of our lives, it was a real crime scene. I want to show you two fascinating things in scripture. This is a big deal here because John is giving us a beautiful glimpse of this same story. You ready, everybody? Here it is. It, because it was cold, this is where Peter first started his failures, and it was cold outside, and there was household servants, and the guards had made a charcoal fire. We underline that for a reason. Hold that and benchmark it in your mind. They stood around it, and they're warming themselves, and Peter stood there, and that's where he first denied Jesus. And then later in John 21, there's this transition of scenery. Jesus is now resurrected from the dead, and he is now making some post-resurrection appearances. And here's what happens after we fail. We usually go back to the things that we always used to do. We, we become comfortable. And Peter and the disciples, the people that were closest to Jesus, they were afraid. So they went back to doing what they always used to do. And they start fishing again. And they're fishing all night, but they're not catching anything. That is so annoying. Can you imagine that? All night, didn't catch anything. And post-resurrection, Jesus stands on the shore and he says to them, yells out, hey, let your nets down on the other side. And you'll catch, and they catch an amazing bounty of fish. The Bible tells us specifically 153, so much so that the net almost popped. Because Jesus always knows where to point us to, doesn't he? And so Jesus is standing on the shore, and watch this in verse 9, chapter 21. When they got to the shore, they found breakfast waiting for them, fish cooking over a charcoal fire. Park that in your mind. And some bread. So after the breakfast, Jesus talks to Simon Peter and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now, if it was escovitch fish, which is a culinary delight of Jamaicans, I'd say, no, no, man. I'm not, I, I don't know this escovitch fish. But let, he, he says, hey, yes, Lord, I, I, you know I love you. He says, then feed my lambs. Jesus repeated the question. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you, you know I love you. He says, then take care of my sheep. A third time he asked, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt this time that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, then feed my sheep. Notice what's interesting about this whole thing. At the first fire... Peter denies Jesus. But to set the scene of his restoration, the first thing that Jesus does is set a fire before him. I want to let some of us in this room and those of us that are joining online know something. That Jesus has set a second fire before you because he wants you to forget what you did in the past. 
Stop trying to focus on getting back your second wind and start understanding God is bringing you to this second fire so that you can affirm again. Now notice three times Jesus asked him a question that he had to affirm out loud. Why? Because there was three denials. He gave him three opportunities in front of a different fire. He's like, Peter, I know you failed three times at that fire, but at this fire, I'm going to give you an opportunity to affirm me, to show that you love me. I'm giving you a second chance at this second fire. And I don't know about you, I love God's grace. I do. Some of us need to come back to the second fire that Jesus has prepared. Now notice, he had already prepared fish on the shore. Whether they caught fish or not, Jesus had already made provision. It's not about your effort. It's not about your ability. You can't produce enough goodness to attract God. You, you can never be righteous enough to get God to be magnetically attracted to you. He's magnetically attracted to you because he gave us his son. Now, listen to me. Listen to me. This is one of the reasons why I'm passionate about us reaching people far from God but close to us. Next week, I want to make sure that in every one of our six gatherings that we have packed out auditoriums. Why? Because people are far from God and they feel like they've denied him so much that they can't have a relationship with him. Your responsibility as a follower of Jesus, if you're here and a regular attender, is to invite somebody that you know, that you have a relationship with. Don't be a coward because here's what cowards do. They just invite a lot of people that they've never met in their entire life. That's, there's nothing wrong with feeling a spirit-led thing to connect with people. But again, you know what my favorite Mitch Hedberg joke is, right? When people give you a flyer, they're saying to you, here, you throw this away from me, right? <laughs> what I'm asking you to do is to get personal with people. Invite them here. Get, here's the deal. Here's the deal. One of the biggest ways that many Christians deny Jesus is in their lack of witnessing to other people. We like to camouflage our Christianity on Sundays with people here in this auditorium, and then we get out into the world and we don't show out. I want you to be a peacock out in the world for Jesus, and you camouflage when you're around other Christians. And I'm not talking about being an offensive type of person that's just so brash, just in people's face with the weird old Christian eyes, like, do you want to come to church? And like, I don't want you to do that type of thing. I'm saying, hey. Go out there and make a difference. You know why a lot of people don't invite other people to church? Because an invite could be an indictment. It might indict you in the way that people are going to be like, you're a Christian? You go to church? Don't let that stop you. Even if you're the rankest, rawest sinner at your job, you hate everybody, your manager and everything, and you just let everybody know about it, Invite them because the church is a collection of all kinds of people in the spiritual journey. Say, yep, I'm going to church. I need to be saved. Haven't you noticed? You work with me all the time. This is why I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get help and it's free. <laughs> I'm telling you, we're not immune to failure, so we shouldn't be allergic to forgiveness. Here's what I love about God. He never deals with our sin publicly. He deals with us privately. God's not trying to embarrass you today. Here's what Paul says. This is big. Paul, who was a New Testament leader, and he started churches and then wrote letters to churches to help them grow spiritually. Those letters are now the New Testament. Many of them are in the New Testament. He said, I, I received something. I'm passing it on to you as of importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas. Cephas is another name. It's Peter right there. He was seen by Peter and then by the 12. In other words, in those post-resurrection appearances, Jesus came to Peter and talked to him first and restored him. You can read about it in two different places in the scriptures. Before Peter got set into mission, Jesus restored him. And getting restoration is tough sometimes. When you've made a failure, a mistake, or you have a pattern of doing things the wrong way, sometimes it's hard. Paul, this same New Testament leader, seemed to struggle throughout the scriptures at times with that identity. It wasn't that he didn't receive grace or he didn't receive his forgiveness. He just kind of wrestled with it. At one time, he said, look, I'm the least of the apostles and do, and, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. Persecuted the church of God. 
at one point in his life, he's going to say, I'm the chief of sinners. I find something fascinating. I read this book called The Fragile Stone by Michael Card about the life of Peter. If you want to know more about the life of Peter, it's a really great read. It's not heavily theological or anything like that. You'll love it. But he says something's missing from First and Second Peter. Not one time do you ever hear Peter say, I, Peter, the apostle that failed the Lord Jesus Christ, writes to you. You never see one verse where he says, I, Peter, who denied Jesus three times. Peter received his forgiveness. And some of us are too recurrent with saying what we've done and making it who we are right now. At some point, you have to receive God's forgiveness and walk in that and realize you are not defined by your denials. Let, 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 me, let me take it a little bit further for some of you today. Your denial does not have to be debilitating. You can do more. You can serve more. You can get back after God even though you've denied him in areas of your life. God is not interested in throwing you away. He is interested in pulling you in. This is why Peter says, in your hearts, honor Christ, the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone. Because after you've denied Jesus, the best thing that you can do is try to defend him yeah. in your day-to-day -day life. I want to let you know today. If there's something that you don't hear enough in Christian circles, and this is where I land the plane, this is where I close. John 21 says it this way. John says, Jesus is talking to Peter. He says, hey, I tell you the truth. When you were young, you were able to do as you liked. You dressed yourself and went wherever you wanted to go. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and others will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And Jesus was letting him know what kind of death he would have to glorify God. And then Jesus told him, follow me. Historians tell us that Peter was crucified upside down. Jesus was actually prophesying about his death ultimately. So here's a second practical application point. Follow Jesus completely. Because the call of Christianity is for denial, but it is also for death. It's why Jesus would say to other people, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Some of us live in denial for the wrong things. You're in denial. Like you really think you're going to make it to the NBA. You're not. <laughs> you, you really think you're going to get on American Idol. Como se dice? Probably not. We're in denial. We're not that good. But to be a really good Christian, you have to be in denial. Denial of your own desires, your own will, your own plan, your own purpose, your own goals at times. In exchange for God, I'm telling you, the life of Christianity is a call to live in denial and to live in death. Jesus says, follow me, take up your cross, and you will find real life when you lay yours down first. <laughs> Guess what? Christianity is for losers. I know you don't want to be a loser, but Jesus says, unless you lose your life, you'll never find the real life I'm trying to give you. We're not immune to failure, guys. So don't be allergic to forgiveness. And what I love about Jesus is that that failure, that, that failure, Peter, he ends up becoming the ambassador of the first church. He preaches probably the most important message in the Bible's New Testament at the inaugural debut of the church. What could God do with you in your denials, in your community, in your family, in your city, in your, your marriage? I know that you've denied, like I've denied Christ in different ways, but now is not the time for us to get anemic in our faith. It's time to be built up in our faith. In this story here, as we close out this teaching series, I'm asking you, for Pete's sake, would you start following Jesus completely? For Pete's sake, would you stop this kind of half in, half out spirituality? For Pete's sake, would you get devoted to living for Jesus, serving, giving of your time, your talent, your treasure? Would you be that kind of witness in your community? Would you serve others that are far from God but close to us? Listen to me. Your denial is useful. It, it, it humanizes us sometimes when we realize that denials also bring new dependency.
And every time we make a mistake, we find a new way to have Jesus become the person that we're more dependent on. Now, if you're here today and you've been allergic to God forgiving you, you just can't accept that he's overlooked your denials. Or maybe you're here today and you know that you're living in a season of your life where you're not immune to failure and you know that you need greater dependency on God but you don't want to become allergic to his call, to his pulling on you. If you're a follower of Jesus and you know today, I, I, I need to keep my proximity close to Jesus. If you know that you feel some distance between where you were last week or last month or last year with Jesus, Peter's greatest denials began when he had mileage away from Jesus. If you're here today and I feel God's presence and his Holy Spirit here, if you're here today, you're following Jesus, you're saying, I want to close the gap. I want to be as close to Jesus as possible in Christ alone. We sang that hymn on purpose, in Christ alone. If you're here and you're saying, I want to keep my proximity close to Jesus, I know I'm not immune to failure, and that's why I've got to be as close to him as possible. Raise your hand big and bold above your head right now and say, that's me. I just want to follow him. I, I want to be close to him. I, I don't want to be far from him. Amen. Look at how many people are raising their hands in this audience. Let me pray for you right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, for every person that's raised their hand in this room, they are saying, I don't want my denial to be debilitating, God. I haven't witnessed when I felt the prompting of your spirit. I haven't been obedient to reading your word when I, when I felt you calling me to scripture. I haven't increased my appetite for prayer at times because I've been so busy with tasks and work and with the kids and schlepping them around. God, I'm asking you right now to let my denials lead to greater dependency. We love you, Jesus. We want to be more committed to you. We want to be followers of you that, that, that are recognized where we don't have to camouflage our Christianity we don't have to subvert anything. We lay our palm branches down today. We worship you as the king and the leader of our lives, God. We cry out Hosanna, which means save us, Lord. We, we cry out Hosanna today, God. Save us from ourselves. We want to live in denial. A good denial. Picking up our crosses to follow you. And everybody said, amen. Now, I know that there's some people here today joining us online and maybe some of us that are in this auditorium. You've never started a relationship with God. And today, you realize more than anything else that you're not immune to failure. You know about the mess-ups and the mistakes and so on. But you've thought, I, I can't be forgiven. You you doubted the power of forgiveness in your life. And if you're here, you need to start a relationship with God. Today is not the day for you to be thinking about what you did and how many times you did it. Today is for you to start thinking about the grace for what you did and how many times you did it and having it applied to your life. And so while no one's looking around, this is the moment of the gathering. If you're here today and you haven't started a relationship with God, do not let your past denials debilitate you. God wants to have a relationship with you. So this is how you start it. This is the first sentence of many paragraphs and many chapters of a relationship with God. Here's how you do it. You can use my words. You don't have to pray out audibly, but you do need to say something like this because the Bible teaches that if you believe that Christ was raised from the dead and if you confess in your heart that he is Savior and Lord and you say that with your mouth that you will be saved. That's what the scriptures teach. So here it is, everybody. You do it this way. Father, I've made many mistakes. Mistakes the Bible calls sin. And I'm sorry. I turn away from that lifestyle and now I turn to you. And I'm asking that you fill me with your spirit. I surrender my life to your son. And I want to walk with you much closer. And I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We'd love for you to join us live at one of our gatherings. We also have life groups that meet all across Westchester so that you can make new friends and grow spiritually. For more information or prayer, please contact us at info at Until next time, live for real.